Okay, it looks like uh, we are live, so welcome everyone to the Office of Tax Appeals. Today's oral hearing is for the appeal of CSI Elysio, Inc., and this will be live streamed. We also have a stenographer present um, who will create a transcript of the proceedings today. Um, that transcript will become a part of the public record and it will also be posted on our website. Uh, to ensure the accuracy of the record, um, I'd ask that the stenographer please feel free to interrupt the proceedings at any time if there's anything that uh, she is not able to understand today. Um, I'd also like to offer just a couple of reminders. I know everyone um, in this room is a prior participant is probably familiar with how this works, but uh, just remember the microphones, you need to turn them on before you speak and you need to speak uh, directly into the microphone so that it can pick up on our live stream. Um, and that means you can't push it off to the table because we can't hear you. You you really have to talk right into this microphone uh, to be able to be picked up on the live stream. Um, with that said, um, yeah, please remember to speak directly into the mic. And also, please remember that because this is being live streamed, um, anything that you say and anything that you share um, and visible on the screen will be visible to people watching our live stream today. Uh, with that said, are there any questions before we uh, go on the record? City TFA is nodding. No questions, thank you. Okay, and for uh, appellant? We're good. Great, so um, we are ready to start the record. Um, we're opening the record and the appeal of CSI Elysio Inc. Uh, this matter is being held before the Office of Tax Appeals. The OTA case number is uh, 1803-2469 and today's date is Tuesday, September 20th. 2022. The time is approximately 1.01 p.m. Uh, this hearing is being conducted in Sacramento, California, and it's also being live streamed on our YouTube channel. Uh, today's hearing is being heard by a panel of three administrative law judges. My name is Andrew Kui, and I'll be the lead judge. Uh, the other panel members are Judge Suzanne Brown and, to my right, Judge Josh Aldrich. Um, we are, um, the three of us are the panel that will be deciding this appeal. All three judges will meet after the hearing and produce a written, a written decision as equal participants. Although I will be conducting this hearing, any judge on this panel may um, ask questions or otherwise participate in this appeal to ensure that OTA has all the information necessary to decide this appeal. With that said, uh, would the parties please state their names um, uh, for the record and who they represent. I'll start with the representatives for CDTFA, please. Jared Noble with the California Department of Tax and Fee Administration. <coughs> Scott Claremont with CDTFA. And Jason Parker with CDTFA. Okay, and I'll turn to appellant's uh, representatives. Good afternoon, Joe Vinatieri on behalf of CSI Aliso. Patricia Verdugo on behalf of CSI Elisa. Okay, thank you. And um, I understand, uh, Mr. Vinatieri, that you also have uh, one witness. Uh, David Gubser is your witness uh, present in this room? He is present in the front row. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Um, so I understand that with that, there is one witness testifying, and CDTFA does not have any objections to the witness testimony. Is that correct for CDTFA? That's correct. Okay. And uh, as far as the exhibits are concerned, um, I provided a copy of the exhibits via a digital link to the parties. Um, so for CDTFA, it was attached to the minutes and orders. For appellants, um, it was an amended exhibit binder so that it came out under separate cover via email. They were both uh, SharePoint links. Uh, did either party not receive uh, exhibit binder or are we good with exhibit binders, uh, CDTFA? We received it, thank you. Okay. And we are good. Okay, great. Uh, so uh, for CDTFA, um, we have exhibits A through G, and these are the same as were discussed during the pre-hearing conference. Um, and I understand that appellant does not have any objections to CDTFA's exhibits. Um, exhibits A through D were previously submitted with the briefing, and there were three new exhibits, E, F, and G. Um, oh, and they were submitted on the day of the pre-hearing conference, so I, I think uh, Palin's representative didn't have an opportunity to, to look at them um, prior to the time of the pre-hearing conference, so I'll turn over to Palin's representative, um, and please remember to push the microphone button when you, when you speak. Uh, did you have any objections to any of CDTFA's exhibits A through G? No. Okay, great. And um, so CDTFA, uh, just to confirm, you don't have any additional exhibits, is that correct? That is correct. 
Okay, and then I will turn over to appellant's uh, exhibits. Uh, for appellant, I have uh, exhibits numbers 1 through 26. Um, I think exhibits 1 through 22 were uh, previously submitted during the briefing process, but they were just renumbered um, from prior exhibits 1 to 18 to 1 to 18 to new exhibits 1 through 22. Um, in addition, there were four new uh, exhibits, three pictures, and uh, the timeline that's on the chair over there, um, which I think is, th um, so my understanding is those four new exhibits are demonstrative evidence to be used with the witness testimony. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Um, so, uh, that's CD correct. Okay, thank you. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I, I guess I to toggle it so that the green light shows up when you speak. Uh, just getting feedback online. I'm sorry about that. Uh, so uh, with that said, you don't have any additional exhibits today, do you? Uh, we do not. Okay. And uh, CDTFA, do you have any objections uh, to the uh, exhibits 1 through 26 as provided in the second revised exhibit binder? We do not. Okay. Uh, great. Then uh, appellants, exhibits 1 through 26 and CDTFA's exhibits A through G are admitted um, into evidence without objection from either party. Um, I'll just, so uh, during the pre-hearing conference, we had discussed uh, seven um, items which were agreed by the parties and not in dispute. I, I don't want to go over them again because we've already talked about them, but I'll just confirm they were summarized in the minutes and orders and uh, were those correctly summarized, CDTFA, didn't, uh, I guess, agreed to those seven items? Um, there was one portion where it was said it was undisputed that there were two separate transactions. So I think looking at the exhibit index provided by appellant, there was an initial contract and then an addendum to the contract. Okay, so CDTFA, you no longer agree to, I think that was number three, where it said the disputed items involved two transactions with Big West, so you don't, know, you don't agree with that anymore? Or? It appears to be a continuous transaction, a contract and then a contract addendum. Yeah, we don't agree, correct. Okay, so I, um, I will strike number three. Um, that leaves uh, six remaining items. Um, for appellant's rep, did you um, have any issues with any of those remaining uh, six items? Uh, we obviously disagree with the characterization of the the one item that was just presented, but other than that, we're good with this. Okay, great. Um, so then I'll make a note, um, and during uh, when we issue a written opinion, those uh, remaining six items may be listed as factual findings which are not disputed by um, and which are agreed by both parties. Um, uh, during the pre-hearing conference, uh, we listed uh, seven um, issues and uh, two of those issues had sub issues uh, questions raised by OTA about whether or not we have jurisdiction uh, I, I don't want to uh, take up too much time restating all the issues because they were listed in the minutes and orders and they're listed on the agenda I'll, but I would like to confirm with CDTFA do you have any um, question objections or concerns with how those um, issues were summarized in the minutes and orders no we do not Okay, and for appellant's representative, uh, are you also okay, uh, or do you have any concerns with how those issues were summarized in the medicine orders? I think the way they are stated is is okay. I'm not sure that, candidly, you'll, we'll be into our presentation that um, the um, the five are as characterized as they are here. I think you'll find out with testimony it, it's a little bit different than um, a stopple, for example. I mean, we're still... We're saying it, but it's not the issue that it used to be. Okay. I'll um, definitely, when we issue the decision, we'll take into consideration um, the arguments that are presented, and if any um, revisions are, are necessary, it might potentially revise or tweak the issue statements a bit uh, based on the arguments and um, testimony provided by the parties today. Uh, but for the meantime, I will list um, them as currently uh, summarized, subject to potential revision as appropriately determined by CD, um, I'm sorry, by OTA after the, the hearing. Okay, um, so what I have on my notes is that we have a time estimate of approximately uh, two hours uh, for this hearing, so that would take us to shortly after 4 p.m. Um, and the time estimate that I have, um, the order of presentation, I'm sorry, that I have is uh, we'll start with the taxpayer's opening presentation. Um, for that, we have allocated 20 minutes. Um, followed by 60 minutes for uh, witness testimony. 
Um, and after that, CDTFA will have uh, 25 minutes for their opening presentation, uh, followed by Appellant will have 10 minutes on final rebuttal. Uh, CDTFA has waived um, their final rebuttal. And um, I'm sorry, I, I said that would take us to f shortly after 4 o'clock. So I can't do math. Uh, 1 o'clock uh, plus 2 hours takes us shortly after 3 o'clock. Uh, <laughs> and I'm also told, uh, I, I'm asked uh, to, someone asked me to ask Mr. Vinatieri uh, if you, um, it's a little hard to hear you. If uh, you don't need to hold the button down, just make sure that the green light is on. And then talking to the mic, I, I'm not sure if there's something uh, wrong with the, with your uh, with the microphone setup, but they're just asking uh, because it's hard to hear you online. If potentially, possibly, you could speak a little closer to the mic. I will swallow the mic. <laughs> All right. Uh, thank you. I, uh, <laughs> well, um, I hope I hope that'll be sufficient. I don't want to keep bothering you about that. So, um, with that order of presentation, two hours. Uh, are there any? Uh, did I get anything wrong there, or is that sound uh, correct uh, to, to UCDTFA? Sounds correct. Thank you. Okay, and uh, Mr. Vinatieri, does that order presentation work for you too? Correct. Okay, great. Then um, I will turn it over to you for your opening presentation, and I will have to swear in your witness before you start. Uh, turn it over to witness testimony. Sure. All right. Thank you. You have uh, twenty minutes until one thirty. Thank you. If for some reason you can't hear me, then let me know if you would. So we say good afternoon to you. And we're Joe Vinatieri and Patricia Verdugo of Bewley Law, Slavin and Miller, LLP, counsel for the appellant. Uh, Matt Beal, president of uh, appellant CSI Aliso, is here behind me to my left. David Gubser is back here also. He's a witness for CSI Aliso. And we appreciate the opportunity to present our case. Uh, it's taken a long time to get here, to be candid with you. So uh, this is our day, and we appreciate that. This case is relatively straightforward. CSI Aliso designs and fabricates through subcontractors sophisticated catalytic reactor systems utilized in oil refineries and other heavy process industries. And on occasion, they will install those systems, which is what happened here. However, we believe what was missed at the CDTFA appeals level was the fact that there were two transactions, two separate and identifiable contracts. One contract for the design and fabrication of the selective catalytic reactor systems and several months later a separate contract for the installation of those systems at the Big West refinery in Bakersfield. So why is it important that there are two transactions and not just one overall contract for design, fabrication, and installation? For the answer, we need to look at the first transaction. Now, as you can see on our timeline here, in which we'll be referring to uh, quite frequently, at the time that the appellant received the resale certificate that was given in good faith, which was agreed to by the audit staff, the only transaction in existence was a contract for the design and fabrication of the SCR system. Now, I'm going to go to the timeline and just point out to you, and it's a little difficult here, but this is our Exhibit 26. But the way we put this here is we have two transactions. The first one is for design and fabrication. The second one is for installation. So on 32406, all the way to the left, we had what we call master services agreement. You're going to hear about what that's all about. After that, in June 61206, there was an addendum uh, to the MSA, and that serve to, to move cer certain things forward you're going to hear about. Then on 103106 was the resale certificate that was given by uh, Big West for emission control equipment and services. And I want you to note that was 103106. Then 1206, there was a request to bid on the installation of the, d the fabrication items that have been fabricated. So there was a request to us to uh, uh, basically bid on the installation. You're going to hear about what that was all about. Thereafter, the second transaction took place, 2907. There was an installation addendum to the master services agreement. There was a cold commissioning once it had been all assembled, and you'll hear about the erector set and, and uh, from the ground up. 
cold commissioning to see if it worked on 52307 and then on 607 operating permits and it's in the record and you know this but this is all about uh, meeting AQMD requirements in uh, Kern County for this refinery so I'm going to keep coming back to this uh, timeline uh, over and over because it's important that you understand how this went down at the time that at the time that we um, did the the first transaction design and, and fabrication there was no contract for installation no contract for installation it wasn't until December as I just indicated that Big West even requested that we bid on an installation contract of the items that we had designed and then had fabricated by the subcontractors. Um, that bid was accepted, as we see on the timeline here, uh, in 2907. So again, why is this critical? Because at the time of the receipt of the resale certificate, 123106, there was no construction contract for installation. In fact, much of the appellant's business during the audit period related to design and fabrication, which was performed for a number of customers. Resale certificates were provided by those customers, and the audit staff in this audit accepted those resale certificates for those other customers. This is the only situation in the audit that was questioned by the auditor, and assumedly because the auditor believed that this was just one contract for design, fabrication, and installation, when in fact there were actually two contracts and two transactions. The inclusion of the design and fab as taxable is erroneous, as it should have been treated like all the other design and fab contracts that we did work on as a sale for resale. Now the second transaction over on the right side there relates to the installation of the fabricated, by now fabricated, SCR system. And as you're going to hear, Big West came back to the appellant, requested a bid, and then selected appellant as the installation contractor. The installation, similar to your Prax Air case, took place like an erector set, one on top of another, with equipment installed on equipment all the way from the ground up. It was not assembled on the ground at all. Uh, also, importantly, most of the alleged tax will measure on the installation on the second transaction relates to installation labor, engineering charges, some further design, and other non-taxable charges. So we went back and reviewed the DNR, which directed the audit staff to re-audit for more possible ta non-taxable charges in the audited measure. The um, appeals attorney said go back and look and see if there's some more non-taxable. The auditor did so, but only partially. So we, what we did, Ms. Verdugo went back and reviewed all the alleged taxable measure, found numerous instances where installation labor and other items had not been deleted. So in an effort to economize this case, we brought this to your attention over a year ago, asking that you direct CDTFA to go back and review the taxable measure where Ms. Verdugo had extensively reviewed source documents. We have actual source documents. And she had ticked and tied. She put it together. Needless to say, we were disappointed that our efforts to streamline this case by giving you this information well in advance was denied. So today, we are bringing you that information Again, we ask you to accept that information, which will dramatically diminish the erroneously determined measure. So in the minutes and orders of the pre-hearing conference, you had the five issues on appeal were set forth. The first three issues relate to the resale certificate, whether it was accepting good faith, whether CDTFA is a stopped, and whether Reg 1521 is in conflict with Section 6092 of the R&T Code. In light of the fact that the resale certificate only relates to the first transaction. Surely. Okay. In light of the fact that the resale certificate only relates to the first transaction, the design and fabrication of the equipment, remember there was no installation at this point, those three issues really shouldn't be issues in light of the fact that the resale certificate was given in good faith for the purchase of emission control and equipment and services, which is our Exhibit 4. You can see that resale certificate in there. As I indicated, 
103106. So we're going to be will- calling as a witness David Gubser, who was with CSI Aliso's predecessor company and CSI Aliso when these two transactions took place. He was a project manager on the design and fabrication contract, and he was the project manager on the installation contract in Bakersfield. He has firsthand testimony regarding both contracts, the history of the Big West two projects, and he's worked closely with Ms. Verdugo in determining the amount of installation labor off of the uh, work orders, etc., that should not be in the taxable measure. So our view on the first transaction, there was a contract for design and fab, and the resale certificate was given. It was given in good faith because it was a sale for resale because it was all tangible personal property at that point in time. On the second transaction, based on the source documents, the taxable measure has to be reduced for installation labor. Other uh, non-taxable charges, per the information that's provided, and you're going to hear some testimony on it, uh, and it's provided in that motion dated May 2021. Bottom line, with respect to the first transaction and the second transaction, once you de- detail it all out, there should be zero tax liability. Zero. So uh, with that, I want to uh, call David Gubser, and I'd like you to make sure, and I know you'll do it, but listen very carefully because he's both an expert witness and a percipient witness. He was there for the two transactions, and uh, his, his testimony is critical to your adjudication of this matter. We call David Gubser, and we're going to do a little moving around here. Okay, uh, Mr. Gubser, before you proceed, I uh, may ask that you raise your hand. I'm going to swear you in. Uh, do you swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Uh, yes, I do. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, you may proceed, and just remember the green light should be on in the microphone. You don't have to hold it. Just uh, do speak closely to the microphone, please. Good afternoon. Um, this is Patricia Verdugo. Can you hear me okay? A little bit closer. How about that? I know it's kind of hard. I'm going to be turning toward Mr. Gumster, so I apologize. Um, just let me know. Uh, Mr. Gumster, thank you so much for being here today. Uh, for the record, can you state your full name? Uh, my name is David Anthony Gumster. Okay. And could you describe your background, including your education and professional credentials and, and your expertise? Yes. Uh, I'm a mechanical engineer. I uh, graduated in, uh, in engineering, a Bachelor of Science degree mechanical engineering from Loyola Marymount University. My background has been primarily, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> primarily in heat transfer um, design, industrial processes, and uh, food processing as well. Um, during my career, I was involved in the uh, work of many power plants. Those power plants were uh, designed to burn coal, natural gas, and biomass. Prior to joining AUS, I worked for 19 years with LG&E Energy. LG&E Energy was a wholly owned subsidiary of Louisville Gas and Electric Utility with uh, Kentucky Utilities in Kentucky. The lg Energy was an independent uh, subsidiary. <clears throat> we designed, we developed, first of all, we developed independent power projects. So we developed, we designed them, and in most cases, we constructed those 
power plants. There were 22 power plants during my career, both in the U.S. and South America. Thank you, Mr. Gubster. And could you describe <coughs> the positions that you held at the company, uh, CSI Aliso? Yes. Um, in, at uh, AUS, I was the chief operating officer through 2004. And following that, the president until 2006. Whereupon, in the end of April of 2006, I resigned my position to explore a new business opportunity. And <clears throat> after I had left, I learned, of course, later on, and you'll find out why, AUS was sold to uh, Catalytic Solutions, and therefore it became CSI Aliso. In October, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> in October of 2006, my former CEO and current CEO of CSI AUS called to meet me for coffee one morning in October. And uh, we were uh, good friends, so we sat down and talked, exchanged normal amenities, and then he says, Dave, I'm in trouble. I said, well, what's wrong? And he says, well, we did sign the con a contract with um, Big West at the Flying J Refinery in Bakersfield, and the work was to be a design and construct, I mean a design and fabricate equipment for the project. And he said, we are severely behind schedule. I really need you to come back. I said, uh, bear with me, but you know I've already been down this road with the company. I'd rather not take on the responsibilities of a project and the operation of the company. He said, that's fine. You come back and take care of this project, focus exclusively on this project. I will set you aside in it with the team, and you press on because we have a lot of ground to make up. His estimate was we were two months behind on a contract, and we had three months to finish it for a five-month activity. <clears throat> and so you came back to CSA, Lisa, to So I relented. I said, under those conditions, I'll come back. So I joined him in uh, mid-October of 2006. And at that time, I received the documents defining the scope and the work relative to uh, the design and fabricate uh, equipment. And there was n no uh, mention in the uh, addendum to the agreement whatsoever in the purchase order of installation. So just for the record, I mean, the documents that you're referring to, Mr. Gubser, is that the Master Services Agreement of March 2006, you were still president and signed that document. Is that correct? I was. Okay, so that was the March 2006. And then sometime in June or before you came back, um, they finalized the scope of the work, and that's, you know, the what we refer to as an addendum, and, and, w and you came back in October. When you came back in October, what was the scope of the project? Scope of the project was design and fabricate equipment, ship it to the site for others to construct or for someone to construct. Um. So that is Appellant's uh, Exhibit 11. That's the June 2006 letter, um, just for reference. Um, and, and again, you were not there in June, but when you came back in October, you reviewed those documents. Is that correct? I did, and it, it was in the form of a purchase order. Now, let me go back to the Master Service Agreement, if I might. Master Service Agreement was an agreement as a certified contractor by contract, I use that term loosely because it doesn't mean anything, but you're, uh, you've been uh, performed due diligence so that you can do work for the refinery. You know the rules. We have looked at your experience and background, and we, we say, okay, if we give you some work, here are the general terms and conditions of doing work at the Flying J Refinery. There was no attachment as to the work that was going to be involved. 
And so what did describe <coughs> the work that was to be involved? Well, there was a proposal, a final proposal. I learned when I returned in October, a final proposal presented in June of uh, 2006. That was the substance of the detail proposal for the work um, for design and fabrication. And could you describe <coughs> this design and fabrication process of the system and your role once you came back? I was the project manager and therefore I had the responsibility of performance. Uh, performance for uh, getting the equipment fabricated according to the standards that we had, the, the design specifications, to ensure the quality was, uh, was uh, present relative to all the uh, fabricators, and to administer um, the uh, schedule to ensure that we got things to the site as, we, uh, as necessary. Now, we, we hired third-party contractors, and we gave them specific specifications, timelines, terms and conditions, and we also gave them what I discovered in the Master Service Agreement and received in October the uh, tax-exempt certificate. They all required it to be a part of the purchase order that went to each third-party fabricator. Those f third-party fabricators were people that made <coughs> components, the equipment, tanks, pumps, fans, uh, skids, structural steel, uh, SCR reactors, catalyst, and items such as that, and all the electrical con uh, equipment that goes with it. So this is all the third party, <coughs> the third party contractors. Uh, fabricated all the pieces of the SCR system that a AUS and CSI at least so designed. Is that engineered? Yes, uh, we designed, engineered them. They supplied them. They were to deliver them to the site. Okay. Uh, Mr. Gubster, I'm going to show you um, what is Appellant's Exhibit Seven. I'll give everyone a chance to find that. It's Appellant's Exhibit Seven. Um, this is uh, the Flying J SCR system schematic. Could, and I believe uh, this explains what the SCR system is. C using this exhibit, can you describe what this SCR system is and its purpose? Yes. Um, it's a, um, a very complicated process, but I'm going to uh, simplify it significantly. The refinery process is in, involved in heaters and, re uh, and, and boilers. They would fire their heaters and boilers with uh, natural gas and or refinery gas. That would fire their product. The pipe in the, ref the various processes contained the product, the product that they were going to refine into other products. So there was no contact between the flue gas or the refinery, the hot gases that are going through it, it was strictly a method of transferring heat from uh, the furnace to the product in the pipes. And in the, and in, in the process, the f it was heated to specific temperatures and then the, the gas, after it was completed its heating process, went out to the stack. And at the green spot on that exhibit is where that gas is diverted from the stack to our reactor. In the reactor, are, there are two catalyst membranes that are critical in reducing carbon monoxide and NOx, which were the criteria in the Air Pollution Control District specifications. So the first catalyst is carbon monoxide, which we all know is a, uh, is a gas that has been focused in the uh, media and so forth to reduce uh, our footprint of carbon monoxide. That was reduced in that first uh, catalyst membrane, which was a, a exotic metal membrane, to uh, from uh, say 100 pounds of carbon monoxide to 10. So it was a 90% reduction. That gas then passes into that in-between membrane, 
with those little holes, and that's where the ammonia vapor is injected ahead of the uh, of the SCR catalyst. The tungsten vanadium catalyst then reacts with the ammonia, and that NOx is reduced to free nitrogen and water, and that again is reduced by 90%. So that's fundamentally what happens in the reactor, the SCR reactor. And then that same gas goes back out to the same stack, only it's been, its emissions have been reduced to the required levels. The, uh, you can see down at the bottom of that uh, example is where the ammonia tank is, and then a vaporizing skid, which we'll refer to later. Thank you, Mr. Gibbs, sir. And to reiterate what you said before, um, under the MSA and then the <coughs> final scope, was the company contracted to install the SCR system that it designed and fabricated at that time? No, it was not. Um, it was not contracted to do any installation whatsoever. And at, at that time, did the company receive a resale certificate for the SCR system? Yes, when I returned in October, the resale certificate. Uh, came forward. Now, it's also important to note that the general, what I call boilerplate master service agreement was just an authorization that you can do work and you're going to do some work, whatever that's defined, sometime in the future. And that work had various uh, terms and conditions in it, as any contract would. One of the items that's mentioned in that contract specifically is that there would be a resale certificate issued. And a part of what we did with the individual fabricators was to, we were required to pass that resale certificate on to each and every fabricator, which we did during our uh, design and fabrication. And Mr. <coughs> Gipser, well, first, the, for the record, the uh, resale certificate we're referring to is Appellant's Exhibit 4. Uh, Mr. Gebser, was it common for the company to receive resale certificates for these types of projects? It depends on the project configuration, but at any time that we did a design and supply, which was a number of times, we would receive a certificate. So it was common in s those circumstances. Thank you, Mr. Gebser. Um, Mr. Gebser, was there a point when the company was contracted to install the system? <coughs> was there a point when the company was contracted to install the system? Excuse me for a minute. Sure. During the critical um, phase of starting to deliver the equipment that was contracted on, on the first contract, um, we were asked in December because the deadline, if you recall from the agreement, uh, that you, the timeline over here is that we had to be fully operational and pass the test and receive our operating permit by June 1 of 07. So time was of the essence. We had equipment all over the country and some out of the country that we were building. And that had to all be fit into place and installed and then commissioned, aligned, commissioned, tested, certified, as passed. And the deadline was fixed. Flying J would have to shut down those processes if we didn't achieve that. It was a very um, intense time. So in December, they, they inquired, would you please submit a quote for installation? And we complied, sub put together uh, a fixed price quotation. That had to be fixed price. And it was submitted in January of uh, 07. And in late January, we were told we were awarded the, the installation contract. And it was, from the timeline you can see, it was uh, February 9th before we got the final uh, amendment to the uh, master service agreement for that installation process. 
And Mr. Gebser, once you had that installation contract, what was your role with respect to the installation? Well, I had the responsibility from the beginning, and they didn't want to deviate, so I had the responsibility at the end, which was to um, set up the construction site operation, which involved a number of personnel and an office, a uh, construction manager, uh, uh, discipline inspectors, um, administrative staff for payroll and so forth. That had to be set up. In addition, uh, we were uh, preparing um, subcontract uh, bids from accepted Flying J, Big West, accepted um, subcontractors. So we uh, had to put together that team. But my responsibility, overall responsibility, was to ensure that the uh, design was completed on schedule to, and the, the product um, met all the criteria. So in the installation process, can you describe the installation process at the site? We um, knew that this project, and it was designed in such a way that this equipment would be, would be uh, fabricated as an assembly, as, as a completed component that had to be connected. Uh, that included the uh, large uh, fans, the reactors, the um, continuous diminishing monitoring um, module, and the ductwork and the structural steel. So all of that material, after it was designed, we agreed with each individual supplier that it had to be built in the largest shippable piece possible. All the steel, all the ductwork, and uh, the major components tank had to be completed with all its uh, instruments, and the, uh, the skid was completely uh, assembled so that when it arrived, our responsibility was to fasten it to the foundations, do the necessary alignments, and then pick up these individual large shippable elements. Once the uh, equipment was uh, attached to the foundations, then we would start assembling the, the structural steel and the ductwork uh, much like you would put a Lego set or an erector set together to reach the, and you'll see when we show you a picture, uh, the uh, the um, fact is that we got to go all the way up to the top where the stack is and tie it in. So it was built from the ground up once everything was set on the ground. And you mentioned some uh, contracts with subcontractors. What was the role of the subcontractors in the installation contract? We had two major subcontractors. One was Total Western. That was an approved subcontractor by Big West. And they uh, performed the civil and mechanical work. The civil work was to um, excavate, make foundations, uh, pour the concrete, prepare the concrete, to receive the uh, components. Uh, Adamson Electric, so they provided the, uh, the uh, labor and miscellaneous materials for that work. Um, the uh, electrical subcontractor was Adamson Electric, again, an, an approved contractor. They were responsible for connecting the motors and the instruments such that they could communicate with our control system. And they provided the labor and miscellaneous materials to do that. Thank you, Mr. Gerson. For, for the record and for reference, um, the two subcontractor agreements we're, t we're referring to um, are Appellants Exhibit 14 and Appellants Exhibit 15. Mr. Gebser, um, I have we have two pictures that we're going to show you um, showing the SER system already in place. For each picture, I'm going to ask you to describe what we're seeing and, and um, how the, the system was installed. So the first one uh, is, the first picture is Appellants Exhibit 23, Photo 1. 
and it looks like this. I don't know if anybody has to refer to it, but do you have this in front of you, Mr. Governor? Yes. Okay. Yes, I do. And if you refer back to this simple flow diagram, you'll see at the bottom the ammonia tank and the uh, skid. That's what we're looking at in this picture. You can see the refinery. First of all, don't pay any attention to the date stamps on the drawings, I mean on the photographs. You know, that's one of those early digital cameras that never could keep track of things. Um, so uh, you can see all the stacks and the other processes in the refinery in the, in the background. But what you're looking at in the foreground immediately is the ammonia skid, the one that vaporizes the liquid ammonia from the tank, heats it, vaporizes it, and sends it off to the ammonia grid ahead of the SCR catalyst. The ammonia tank is right adjacent because that's where the, the liquid ammonia is stored. And those two items were uh, set. Uh, the first, uh, the tank was set in, into its containment area and bolted down. And then the skid came in assembled with all the instruments that you see there. Adamson Electric, <coughs> to be specific, connected those little uh, uh, conduits and so forth to the motors and the motor control uh, center. And uh, and uh, that connected everything to our control system. Thank you, Mr. Gebser. And the second picture we're going to show is Appellant's Exhibit 24, Photo 2. And you have this one? Yes. yes. Okay, can you please describe what we're looking at there? Um, this gives you a, a good appreciation of, of the, the work. The first assignment we had, very clearly stated, uh, was that the equipment had to be had to be placed in a location that didn't affect the refinery process at all. It couldn't interfere with its operation because it was still running, and it couldn't get in the way of uh, of their maintenance requirements if they had to go in and do maintenance. So. Our responsibility was to do all of our work, set the equipment, build our erector set from the bottom up without affecting their operations so they could continue. It wasn't, and so the process there that you see that um, to the top left is, a, is sort of a brownish stack. That is the refinery stack. Those other two pipes that are up in the top of that vicinity, the shiny one is the is the uh, gas coming down that would have normally gone out the stack has been redirected to come down to the grade and go through the process that we described earlier. The other one going back up is returning it back to the stack. So you can appreciate that all of this happens, everything happens until you absolutely connect it to the stack. So everything is built independent of that. There's no tie-in to any of their structures. That was a challenge. And that was a requirement of the design. That was a requirement and a challenge. So, so is, if, if I understand correctly, from the first contract, you had subcontractors who fabricated it, and they delivered those pieces pre-assembled to the site. Is that correct? Yes. And then your other subcontractors, Total Western and Adamson Electric, took those pieces and installed it from the ground up. Is that correct? That's correct. And then your team supervised and coordinated the whole process. We did supervise the subcontractors, directed them. We uh, made sure that their equipment was put in. It was all the alignments were prepared. All the cold commissioning was taken care of, and the schedule was frightening. Uh, Mr. Gibson, you described the installation from the ground up. Was there any fabrication performed on, at the site, meaning were pieces put together prior to being placed on the ground? No. Um, as I said before, we had um, the criteria was to to ship the largest pieces we possibly could uh, by truck, which it, it had to be delivered by truck. Um, and then so that all we were, had to do was is to do the connections. The connections were the critical things, and they would speed up the whole process. So we performed all that work in the, in the fabricator's shop 
and did just the connections and the assembly and the uh, building from the foundation up. Thank you, Mr. Gosser. In your extensive experience, could the SCR system be readily removed without damage to the structure or to itself once it was installed? Well, it, it, it's not hard to imagine for anyone that has gone through what we suggested how it was put together. But it's much more difficult to fit those pieces together than it is to take them apart. You can demo a house much faster than you can assemble it. We all know that. So taking it apart, again, the refinery process can continue to operate. The gases c could continue to go out the stack. We just barely, we shut off the, the flow of gases out of and back into the stack and they continue to operate. We disconnect, unbolt, uh, and take apart the pieces we just put together, and then we unbolt the equipment uh, at the, from the foundations and lift them off with cranes and trucks and take them away. So it's significantly shorter than it takes to put things together and align everything. So you're saying if the SCR system is removed, there would be no disruption to the None. operation? None. Just the same requirement that we had going in. You can't disrupt the uh, refinery. So if th there was a requirement that in on installation it couldn't disrupt and on removal. So there was a requirement that on installation you couldn't disrupt operations and on removal it, it wouldn't disrupt operations. Correct. Is that correct? Yes. Now I might point out one other process importance, and this is from an engineer's point of view, maybe not yourselves, but the critical another critical component is that the the throughput of the refinery could not change okay so th that was part of the uh, operating permit that they would get they couldn't change the flow because we did certain things to help their process um, so um, likewise in our design we had to put in operating flexibility such that not only could we meet the standard, but we could meet the standard under varying conditions. So that was a, uh, a, a flexibility that had to be designed for our own protection to meet the guarantees. So um, for the panel, I'm going to ask Mr. Gebser some questions on some of the invoices that provided. And this is with respect to the motion that we submitted with respect to the taxable measure and sort of some of the amounts that we thought should have been excluded from the taxable measure. So um, for the record, this is Appellant's Exhibit 21, which are the invoices that were referenced in the motion. I'm just going to go through a couple of examples, not all of them. The first one being invoice 18, which again is part of exhibit 21, and I'll just. Uh, Mr. Gubster, you have the invoice 18 in front of you, is that? Yes. Yes. And you've reviewed these invoices before with me, right? Yes, that was, uh, yes, my responsibility. I had to prepare the invoices. So you prepared these invoices that were submitted to Big West? Well, I, together with my accountant uh, in the office, yes. Um, can you explain sort of the different sections of this invoice? And this, again, is invoice number 18 dated March 1, 2007, as an example. Yes, there are basically three elements here that you can see divided by the double lines. The first one is uh, that service order ending in 937. So what's going on here is that we're invoicing for the final delivery of the SCR reactors. Then the SIMS was 75% done, so we had a, 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 a partial payment on, uh, on that work. The SIMS, for your uh, um, information, is called the Contigu Continuous Emission Monitoring System. That system is continuously uh, managing and controlling our ammonia flow and our performance. It's also recording and submitting to the agency real-time the emission data. It's a very sophisticated control system. But again, that control system had nothing to do with the refinery control system. It was completely independent. 
So the next item is the uh, H11 fan, which was delivered, so the final payment on that. And the instrumentation controls delivery two. We had to break it up into segments for different areas. So that uh, value at, the, at that point was for those items. The next uh, group is uh, with service order ending in 103. That was for the delivery of the duct work. Now, um, that was probably my fault that I used the term construction, but it was the delivery of the ductwork, period, and it was phase one. Uh, so that's an imperfect description. The next one was all those, both of those parts were part of the design and fabricate. The last item was the construction phase. Uh, that uh, service order uh, is 992, and there is a uh, charge for construction management, which was my construction team and uh, um, the support services going on there. The uh, uh, cost uh, and partial payments at those percentages for, for work complete for both the mechanical contractor and the electrical contractor. So, Mr. Gebser, you, you mentioned, just to, to my understanding, the first part says total building and engineering and equipment contract and performance of contract. That's the first contract for the design work, right? Yes. First section. And then the middle section you said was the duct work. Um, and the third section was the installation contract. The construction management contract. Yes. And then the subcontract costs were what, uh, Total Western and Addison Electric. Would that be correct? Yes. Thank you. Um, so the next uh, sample invoice that we want to just sort of know is invoice number 38. Do you have the that to the form invoice 38? Okay, the first <coughs> part is, is the um, construction management. Now, uh, by the owners, uh, by our agreement with the owner, 10% retention was withheld from every monthly progress payment for um, construction management. So once the project is completed, that 10% uh, retention was paid provided that the work was fully submitted, and that's all the engineering work, all the drawings, all the specifications, and the manuals. The next item is the construction subcontractor. 10% was withheld from their payments. As you could appreciate, you don't want to pay 100% pay of any progress payment because you want to ensure the quality is is complete, there aren't any problems or any corrections that have to be made. So that amount of money is withheld to to ensure that once everything is straightened out and we're willing to accept their work, then that retention would be paid. So this invoice again represents construction management, which was the CSI Aliso Yes. Not on? I'm not on. Sorry. I'll repeat myself. The construction management, the 10% with, withholding, um, was on your uh, installation supervision work? Would that be correct? Yes. And then the second part of that uh, phase two construction subcontractor, those are the 10% withheld with respect to work on the Total Western and Anderson Electric. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. So the next invoice we want to point out point out is the invoice 63, also in Exhibit 21, invoice 63. Uh, this was um, the final closeout invoicing for the project. Um, we had various provisions in the construction contract relative to uh, contingencies and shared responsibilities, 
So all of that was accounted for and identified and agreed to with uh, uh, Flying J or Big West. And the equipment contract was a final uh, a payment on that contract. So this is the final closeout billing for the work. Thank you, Mr. Gumster. And again, those invoices uh, refer to the motion that we submitted and explain why some of the costs that were not removed by the auditors um, under the last appeal were not removed. They were clearly for installation labor, um, final payments, or withheld payments, in addition to others that we pointed out in our motion. Thank you, Mr. Gubster, for your time. And I believe um, the department goes next. Yes, uh, first I turn it over to the department. Uh, do you have any questions for this witness? May we have five minutes to confer beforehand, please? Thank you. Uh, yes, yeah, certainly. Uh, we'll go for a five-minute break. It's currently 2 o'clock. Um, we'll reconvene at uh, 2 or 5. Thank you. All right, thank you.
Okay, I'll, I'll just check with the parties. Uh, CDTFA, are you uh, ready to proceed? We are. Okay, and uh, for appellant, uh, are you uh, ready to proceed? Yes, we are. Okay, so then um, we're going back on the record uh, in the PLS CSI Elysio Inc. I, where we left off, we were about to turn it to CDTFA if they have any questions for the witness. I, I'm sorry, we have no questions for the witness. Thank you. Okay, um, then I think the panel has uh, some questions uh, for, for the witness. Um, I guess I'll start. Uh, the first is just a technical clarification. Um, I think f at some points we're referring to the um, customer as Big West and at other points Flying J. Is Flying J just a DBA or is it the same or different? Well, <clears throat> Flying J is the Big West refinery. That's the name of their refinery. Okay. okay. And so I've 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 always just referred to and you have to excuse me, uh, Flying J because that's what we call it in the in the work. Okay, okay that that's perfect. Thank you. I I just wasn't sure because I saw that on the invoices too, um, so that that is helpful. Um, and then I did have a question because when you were talking about, um, well, I guess depending on if you, the first transaction or the first half of the transaction, I guess depending on on which which side you're looking at. Um, we had the uh, design and the fabrication, and um, you were talking about building it to the largest possible piece yes. for shipment. Um, so was this, sh I guess, assembled outside in California or outside California? It was... Uh, uh, <laughs> you're, you're really taxing my... My recollection, okay, okay. Uh, because we're talking about 16 years ago. So uh, I'm t we had a number of projects going. So I, m yes, so, uh, certainly some of it was fabricated out of um, some of it, or maybe most of it in California, but some of it, I know the fans were made back east, and... Uh, of course, we wouldn't ship the steel very far, so that would be made locally, and and the duct work would be made locally. So, I, I I can't recall exactly where each major element was. The skid was made locally. The ammonia tank, the catalyst was made uh, out of California for sure. I I can say that for sure. Okay, so some of it, they guess, I guess they came from different sources, some inside the state, some outside the state. Yes. Uh, yeah, um, that is helpful. And then I guess with respect to the design, did that include everything that was required to install it on site, or was there additional work like, uh, you know, like a building a foundation or... I guess I'm just wondering to what ex how complete was um, the designed product under I'll call it phase one so to not you know well, make a decision on one side or the other yet. Okay, well, of course the, the contract the subcontractors built what we drew on our plans and specifications. So we designed the the, the foundations. Okay, we had to get building permits for the structures and for uh, the work. So we had to get local Bakersfield building permits. So we did all of the design and they did the installation. Does that answer your question? Uh, yes, I think that helps. And I'm, I guess I'm wondering, so for example, if you, you know, you designed the foundation, was the the cost of the, uh, is that cement mix? Like, for example, like the cost of those pieces, that was something that you paid for and furnished, or is that something that was furnished and installed? No, no, the, the, the mechanical contractor built the foundation to our specification for what concrete to use, what rebar to use, and how deep it had, how thick it had to be, and or how deep it had to be. So they did the installation all of it. They didn't do any design. Okay. Um, so I guess, for example, with some of the invoices that you were 
um, talking about just a minute ago with the 10%, I think it was called like a, re- was it retention or uh, yes. that was like the subcontractor would, for example, they would purchase the specific items that you said had to be used and then they would furnish and install that and then you would They furnished, them. I would call it miscellaneous materials. Okay. Okay, they would furnish the concrete. That's a miscellaneous material. They furnished that material. We oh. didn't go out and buy concrete. You can't really do that. <laughs> right. Yeah, no, I, I guess um, what I was just trying to figure out was uh, to what extent, like, everything was furnished by you in the first phase or if there was a significant amount in, this, in the second phase of the contract. Okay, uh, let me give you, see if I can help. Um, the um, equipment... And all the skids and all the ductwork and all the steel was all furnished by us. The the uh, concrete couldn't be furnished by us because it's, it's an active product that would set up. The rebar we didn't buy. It's much more efficient for them to buy the rebar and supply the concrete than that. Not on the electrical side. There's... There's major components on the electrical side. We bought the major components, the motor control centers, the starters, uh, uh, a lot of that electrical we bought and shipped to the site. The electrical contractor connect, set it up on a stand, or it came in a, in a, uh, a motor control center, comes as a cabinet like you have around here. So those were all provided by us and they set it and connected the conduit to it does that help yeah so it, i mean it sounds like and you know, there was a lot of work involved in the in the installation of uh the product that you designed and fabricated and shipped to the site is i guess I was well yeah to there there's you have to put all those components but they were all uh large elements Okay. Um, and when you were testifying earlier, you had mentioned the disassembly aspect. And I just, to, to make sure I understand correctly, it, this um, wasn't disassembled. You were just speaking hypothetically. Is that Hypothetically, correct? yes. Okay. Um, sorry, just um, one minute. I'm just... Uh, trying to see if there were other questions I was going to ask. In the meantime, actually, I will turn it over. I believe the panel has questions, too. Um, So I'll turn it over to Judge Aldrich. Judge Aldrich, did you have questions for the witness? Hello, this is Judge Aldrich. Uh, Welcome, Uh, Mr. Gubser. I had a couple questions for you, if you don't mind. Um, You had mentioned during, uh, as uh, Judge Kui referred to it, Phase 1, there was a requirement to uh, design, fabricate, and ship it? Yes. Um, and so was anything, was all or part uh, shipped uh, before um, phase two? N- no. Um, there are many components, some very complex, and um, they were uh, awarded the contract in phase one in 06 but some of those items didn't arrive to the site until 07 early in 07 and the crunch factor that you're referring to in the time frame um, where you were two months in on a five month contract was that referring to phase one or phase one yes okay uh, and then so uh, when you were, you had mentioned that um, the refinery would have to shut down if it if it wasn't fitted and co- uh, commissioned in time, yes. that's for phase two at some point? What was it? That, that would be referring to a later period? Yes, yeah. That was in, uh, they had a deadline of, uh, I believe it was June 1. It had to be not only done, it had to be uh, tested and those test results had to be available for the uh, for the agency. Okay. And they had to pass, obviously. And 
then um, are you familiar, um, or I guess have personal knowledge of the uh, AUS, now CSI's uh, accounting system? Uh, no, I'm too far removed from that. Okay. I guess uh, this question might be more for uh, appellant's counsel, um, and he can direct it or, or she can direct it uh, if um, they would like to reply to it. But I was looking through the exhibits, and page 38, there's a reference to a Stephen Freeman. Uh, Could you repeat that, page 38 of which exhibit? Uh, I was referring to the exhibit binder in, in its entirety. Uh, so that's the amended exhibit binder um, for uh, appellant. Um, let me see. It's just an address of uh, Stephen Freeman. Um, I guess I was wondering if, if that was in connection to the schedule that preceded it on pages 30, I think it's pages 35 uh, through 38. Um, yeah, I'm sorry. I, I don't have page numbers. I only have exhibits. So I'm, okay. I don't um, know. We can come back to that. I'll um, refer it back to Judge Kui and uh, to see if there's any other additional questions. Right, I was just looking at the um, exhibit binder uh, to see if I could identify which exhibit that was and it looks like it's marked exhibit four page five of one second let me make it larger exhibit four page five of eight is listed on the bottom um and page six of eight what exhibit was that oh, i think the address um so i see I think um, what Judge Aldrich is referring to, there's an Exhibit 4, page 8 of 8, and it's the page right after that. Um, and I think on our Exhibit Index, it's listed under Exhibit 3. It's because there was like a renumbering, a reshuffling of your exhibits. I think it's actually part of Exhibit 2 because Exhibit 3 starts at page 41. Oh, I see. Okay. Okay, so we're at Exhibit 2, page, what was Towards the end of Exhibit Two. Oh, um, this is this a exhibit to the decision and recommendation by CDTFA? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So, in reference to that uh, submission, uh, was that prepared um, contemporaneously with the um, with Phase One and Phase Two, or was this a schedule that was prepared? Um, in preparation for the appeals conference, I. So we were not in council. We were not uh, involved in this appeal. That was okay. a different law firm, but I do believe they worked with an accountant to uh, provide this document. So we had to read it much as you had to to read it. Is there a specific question other than who was on the address? Uh, I was just uh, wondering about the foundation of the schedule that. It, uh, um, Yeah, it corresponds with. So we initially were using this because it had been provided previously. We didn't have access to the same people anymore. So when we started using, uh, when we had access to Mr. Gubser, um, we started using the invoices that were used by the auditor themselves since that was already sort of vetted. So we used those invoices instead of the schedule since, again, we, could, we didn't have that accountant available anymore. Um, so again, we used the invoices, which were 
um, drafted by Mr. Gumser, um, and he could vouch for what it what they represented. So that's why we submitted the motion with the invoices and not with this schedule. Thank you for the clarification. Thank you. Okay, um, Judge Aldrich, are you? Uh, do you have any further questions? Uh, no further questions at this time. Thank you. Okay, then I will turn it over to Judge Brown. Uh, Judge Brown, do you have any questions for the witness? I think I just have one quick question for the witness uh, on the the uh, the chart diagram behind you um, on the the timeline for the second transaction. It uses the phrase phrase cold commissioning, and I was just wondering if you could define what that means for for our for okay. my understanding. Um, <coughs> after you uh, assemble tie everything together, you you uh, then have to do certain tests, such as uh, bumping motors, making sure, running motors, making sure they're aligned uh, properly, uh, running instrument checks to verify that you've got uh, clean uh, signals going to and coming from the instruments. Um, so th that's kind of like a cold commissioning. Okay, where you just you're you're not processing any gas or or anything, and you're not even connected. You're just uh, running diagnostics on what you've installed. So it's like a test, a testing. Preliminary, uh, preliminary testing, yeah. Okay. But for, it's described that way to indicate that there's there's no hot gases processed. Thank you. This I, is oh, go ahead. Um, you, you. Okay, uh, this is Judge Kui. Um, so I did have one additional question, um, and that relates to the resell certificate that was accepted. Are you are you at all familiar with the process that um, involved accepting the resell certificate from the customer, Big West? Specifically, that resale certificate, or resale certificates in general oh I'm referring to the the one that was accepted for the for the phase one or first transaction well I of course as I mentioned before the, the master uh, service agreement indicated there would be one so that was uh, information that it was coming uh, but I didn't see it until I returned to the company in October okay and uh, so would you have any knowledge about uh, what um, they could because uh, you know resale certificates to sell for resale, um, and then the big sir, from my understanding, was the oil refinery. So, would you have any knowledge about who the intended resale was for? I have not the slightest clue. I'm sorry, but uh, I don't even know. Uh, I wasn't even aware that they uh, what they become became later. I I, I have no clue. Okay. So I, I'm sorry, um, I, I didn't know at the time what their plans were. They held their plans pretty close to the vest. Okay, so that's not something that was uh, addressed or, or talked about at all at the time. No, no, nothing was divulged to us. They didn't, they didn't, uh, uh, they didn't allow that kind of information out of their corporate offices. Okay, uh, thank you. All I could assume that there was some plan in mind. Okay, um, at this point, I believe um, that was the last question I had at this point, and I believe the, the panel has concluded with their uh, questions for the witness, so I will um, at this point turn it over to CDTFA. I believe we had allocated uh, 20... Let me just check the... Cal calendar that I set up. Uh, oh, that's right. Uh, 25 minutes for CDTFA's presentation. So um, I'll just wait a moment for uh, Pellant's uh, representative to change their seats before I turn it over to you.
Okay, so it's now approximately 2.30, um, so that would bring you to 2.55. I'll turn it over to you now, CDTFA. Uh, the ter the determination is the ter determination at issue is based upon a November fifth, two thousand and ten audit report disclosing a disputed measure for claimed non taxable sales for resale of twelve million one hundred sixty eight thousand eight hundred nineteen dollars. This measure all relates to the appellant's to appellant's design, fabrication, sale, and installation of four select selective catalytic reduction systems for Big West of California. As we will explain in greater detail, the department has reduced the measure in dispute by $3.1 million approximately, down to $8.984 million. The issue in this appeal are whether the SER systems are fixtures or machinery and equipment, whether appellant timely accepted a resale certificate in good faith from Big West, whether the department is a stop from questioning the good faith, whether a portion of Regulation 1521 is invalid, and whether there are errors in the audit calculations. Appellant initially entered into a contract for just the design and fabrication of the SCR systems, but later agreed to install the systems pursuant... Sorry, little, little, little fast? No, no problem. Thank you. <laughs> but later agreed to install the systems pursuant to a contractual addendum. According to the contract, the appellant was the prime contractor responsible for furnishing and installing the systems. The systems were installed from January 2007 through May 2007. There is no dispute that Appellant accepted a resale certificate from Big West for the sale of the SCR systems and that Appellant did not report and pay tax on the sale of the systems at issue. It is also undisputed that Big West was required to reduce emissions at the refinery pursuant to San Joaquin Valley Unified Air Pollution Control District Rule 4306 and that, it, still a little too fast? <laughs> it's it's complex area law. <laughs> Agreed. <laughs> and that it decided to do so by purchasing the SCR systems. With respect to whether the SCR system is a fixture or machinery and equipment is relevant here. Regulation 1521 provides that a con construction contract means a contract to erect, construct, or alter any building, structure, fixed work, or other improvement to real property. A construction contract does not include a contract for the sale and installation of tangible personal property such as machinery and equipment. Subdivision A5 defines fixtures as items that are, that are accessory to a bu building or other structure and do not lose their identity as accessories when installed. Subdivision A6 defines machinery and equipment as property intended to be used in the production, manufacturing, or processing of tangible personal property the performance of services, or for other purposes not essential to the fixed works of the building or structure itself, but which property incidentally may, on account of its nature, be attached to the realty without losing its identity as a particular piece of machinery and equipment, and, if attached, is readily removable without damage to the unit or to the realty. In looking at the SCR systems, we first note that the real property the SCR systems are attached to are petroleum refineries and thus are considered fixed works. And there is no dispute that Big West was required to install these types of systems at its refineries and that it would incur fines if it failed to do so pursuant to Rule 4306. To be clear, the refinery cannot legally operate without these types of systems. In addition, there is no evidence that the SCR systems can be functionally used when not attached to the oil refinery or evidence establishing that the systems either produce, manufacture, or process tangi tangible personal property that is not part of the operation of the oil refinery itself. In other words, the SCR systems functions as part of the processing of petroleum production, the very purpose of the refinery. Therefore, the SCR systems are essential and not merely incidental to the purpose of the fixed works, and thus do not meet the definition of machinery and equipment. We also note the installation and incorporation of the SCR systems into the refinery took around five months and required significant time and labor, both in adapting the refinery and in attaching the SCR systems to the fixed works. For example, during the audit, the department found that concrete foundation work took 84 days, 
on-site fabrication and mechanical installation took 90 days, and electrical work took 81 days. In addition, the photos shown in Appellants Exhibits 23 through 25 show that the SCR systems were attached to the property via bolts, piping, electrical wiring, supporting structures, and ductwork, and appear to be no difference in appearance than any other component of the refinery. These photographs are consistent with the declaration provided by Mr. Gubser, Appellants Exhibit 5, wherein he states the scheduled duration for delivery, placement, assembly of the supporting structures, and alignment of the equipment was time-consuming and complex. This further establishes that the SCR systems were not incidentally attached to the refinery and did not maintain its identity as a particular piece of machinery and equipment. Similarly, the evidence indicates that removal of the SCR systems would require extensive labor and cost, including removal, removal of all exposed ductwork and piping, supporting structures, and bolts securing the various components of the system. A declaration submitted in appeal state that this would take anywhere between three to four weeks. An approximate removal time of one month indicates that the SCR systems are not readily removable. In addition, while appellant contends that there would not be extensive damage to the real property because some components could be readily unbolted and removed with the use of a crane, appellant's assertion ignores all the piping, concrete foundations, electrical and ductwork that were incorporated into the real property for the specific purpose of the SCR systems. Removal of these items would cause damage to the real property. For these additional reasons, the SCR systems do not meet the definition of machinery and equipment in Regulation 1521. And then lastly, while the plain language of 1521 establishes that the SCR systems are fixtures, we note that our briefing in this case notes several different cases such as C-Train Terminals of California v. County of Alameda and Crocker National Bank v. City and County of San Francisco that apply a three-prong test derived from property law when determining whether or not property becomes a fixture when it's incorporated into real property. Um, the elements of this test would also show that uh, this was a fixture. So even if we weren't following Regulation 1521, the test applied by the courts would also find that this was a fixture as well. As for the application of tax to appellant sale of the fixtures, it is undisputed that appellant entered into a contract to furnish and install the SCR systems onto real property. Therefore, appellant is a construction contractor and pursuant to Regulation 1521, the retailer of the fixtures it furnished and installed during the performance of the construction contract. As the retailer, appellant owes sales tax measured by its gross receipts from those sales pursuant to Section 6012 and 6051. While appellant asserts that it, it, it accepted a resale certificate in good faith from Big West and should not be liable for tax on its sales of fixtures, with certain exceptions not relevant to this appeal, Regulation 1521 is very specific in stating that a contractor like appellant cannot avoid their liability for sales or use tax on materials or fixtures they furnish and install by taking a resale certificate from someone such as Big West. It does not simply say a contractor cannot take a resale certificate. It specifically states that a contractor in this scenario cannot avoid their liability by taking a resale certificate. Thus, as a matter of law, the, res the resale certificate has no effect and appellant is liable for sales tax on its sale of the SCR systems to Big West. While appellant now asserts that it was not a construction contractor at the time it accepted the resale certificate, the sale at issue and the amounts in dispute were all paid and occurred during 2007. The sale at issue is the construction contract wherein appellant furnished and installed the fixture. With respect to whether portions of Regulation 1521 could or should be invalidated because there is an alleged conflict with Section 91 in Regulation 1668, we first note that CDTFA is required by law to follow Regulation 1521 and must be faithful to its own regulations unless a court of appeal has found the regulation to be invalid. And here, no court of appeal has found it to be so. Indeed, the briefings in this case discuss a number of cases wherein Regulation 1521 is routinely upheld. In addition, pursuant to OTA's presidential opinion in the appeal of Talavera, OTA, respectfully as an administrative agency, also does not have the authority to declare Regulation 1521 invalid. 
We further note there's no actual conflict between the regulation and the statutes. For proper administration of the sales and use tax laws and to prevent the evasion of tax, Section 6091 creates a presumption that all of a retailer's gross receipts are subject to tax until the contrary is established and places the burden to prove that the sale was not a retail, uh, retail upon the retailer unless the retailer timely and in good faith takes a certificate to the effect that the property is purchased for resale. However, pursuant to Regulation 1521, a construction contractor is defined as the retailer of fixtures and cannot avoid their liability by taking a resale certificate. Accordingly, when a construction contractor furnishes and installs a fixture in the performance of a construction contract, that sale is at retail and the provisions of 6091, 6091 are inapplicable. We further note that Section 6092 and Regulation 1668 require that a retailer take a resale certificate in good faith. Since a construction contractor is the retailer of fixtures they furnish and install, and Regulation 1521 says you can't avoid your liability for this, we interpret this to mean that a construction contractor cannot take a resale certificate in good faith for its retail sales of fixtures. As for the measure of tax, during the audit, the department requested a copy of the master contract to establish the retail selling price of the fixtures. However, appellant did not provide any copies of the agreement, cost sheets, or other records that contain price data for the SCR systems. As such, the department, department was only able to examine petitioner's sales journals and determine that all sales to Big West during the liability period, totaling approximately $12.1 million, were included in the price of the fixture. Subsequently, during the appeal, appellant provided approximately two-thirds of the invoices it issued to Big West, which had been provided as Appellant's Exhibit 21. The invoices contained some itemized charges for parts of the SCR system, as well as lump sum charges for labor performed by appellant and two subcontractors. To account for any non-taxable charges for installation of the SCR systems, the department reviewed the invoices and accepted that amounts on the invoices identified as lump sum charges for subcontractors was the best available evidence of any non-taxable installation labor. Accordingly, during the re-audit, subcontractor charges of approximately $3.1 million were removed from the measure. Section 6011 and 6012 provide that the sales price of tangible personal property includes charges for fabrication and all services that are part of the sale without any deduction for labor, service cost, or other expense. Charges for installing tangible personal property onto real property are not subject to tax. The burden is on the taxpayer to establish entitlement to any exemptions or exclusions from tax, and a taxpayer has the responsibility to maintain and make available for examination all records necessary to determine the correct tax liability. When a taxpayer challenges an NOD, the department has the burden to explain the basi basis of the deficiency. Where the explanation appears reasonable, the burden of proof shifts to the taxpayer to demonstrate by a preponderance of the evidence that the deficiency is invalid. Specific to a construction contractor's sales of fixtures, Regulation 1521 provides three ways to determine the sales price of fixtures manufactured by the contractor. First, the sales price is considered to be the price at which similar fixtures and similar quantities ready for installation are sold by him or her to others. If similar fixtures are not sold by the contractor ready for installation, then the price of the fixture is deemed to be the amount stated in the price lists bid sheets, or other records of the contractors. If the sales price cannot be established in either of these manners, then the price of the fixture is an aggregate of material costs, direct labor, factory cost attributable to the fixture, excise tax, a pro rata share of all overhead related to the manufacture of the fixture, which importantly includes job site fabrication, and a reasonable profit, which in the absence of evidence to the contrary, shall be deemed to be 5% of the sum of all preceding factors. Here, despite the fact that appellant initially entered into a contract only for the design and fabrication of the systems, it did not provide the master contract with unredacted prices or otherwise provide documentation establishing the price of the fixture. Nor did it provide information regarding sales of similar systems it sold without installation. Accordingly, the journal entries and sales in invoices showing actual amounts paid to appellant by Big West represent the best available evidence of the sales price of the fixture. 
Furthermore, even without verifiable documents establishing the actual cost of the fixture or specific amounts for non-taxable installation labor, the department accepted that the charges to the subcontractors represent the best available evidence of any non-taxable amounts. Appellant has proposed various figures throughout the appeals process, but we note that the department's estimate is specifically consistent with appellant's estimated price of the fixtures based upon the aggregate of all cost. The department's Exhibit C, beginning on page 23, is appellant's previous calculation of its potential tax liability, showing costs related to the fixture of $6.4 million and a potential tax liability of $6.8 million after accounting for a 5% markup as well as spreadsheets that, according to Appellant, were generated by its accounting software. As explained in detail in Exhibit G, the Department did not accept this calculation because no source documents were provided and because Appellant omitted various mandatory service charges that are part of the sale of the fixture, such as scheduling services, procurement services, engineering and oversight services, engineering for design support, and external engineering cost. Additionally, whereas a 5% markup to the cost is appropriate only in the absence of evidence of a higher markup, here the department calculated a markup of 26.66% for 2008 and 16.73% for 2009 by comparing appellant's recorded gross receipts to its cost of goods sold. Since appellant did not perform any construction contracts in these two years, these markups more accurately reflect the actual markup on its sales of TPP. Even if we were to use the lower markup of 16.73% for 2009 and apply that to the $6.4 million cost appellant calculated, the total comes out to $7.5 million, which again should also be increased by excluded service fees that were part of the sale. So while the department did not accept these calculations, the cost identified in appellant spreadsheets are probative as to the actual cost of the fixtures and an indication that the department's assessment of $8.9 million is reasonable. In contrast, in its brief, appellant asserts that only $1.7 million of the total project cost of $12.1 million represents the sales price of the fixture. Again, by its own calculation, the price was approximately $6.8 million. Appellant's method of calculation does not follow Regulation 1521's provisions on determining the sales price of a fixture, and it would mean roughly that 85.5% of the project value was attributable solely to non-taxable installation labor. In addition to being far below its own previous cost estimate, these assertions are particularly unreasonable in light of Appellant's Exhibit 12, pages 161 and 187, which contain can't contain descriptions of the scope of work of the subcontractors, stating that to minimize refinery downtime and loss of production, foundation work, mechanical, hook, mechanical erection, and electrical installation would be completed before the final tie-ins were executed. In other words, there's evidence that the contract stressed the need to maximize taxable fabrication labor and minimize non-taxable installation labor. Exhibit 12 further describes various types of assembly and wiring that needed to be performed prior to installation and is corroborated by Mr. Gubson's declaration that there was extensive fabrication and assembly on site. Therefore, the department's determination is reasonable and, best on the, and based on the best available evidence and the burden shifts to appellant to demonstrate that further adjustments are warranted. Before turning to the specific reductions asserted by appellant in its brief, it is important to reemphasize that the reason it was necessary for the department to estimate the liability in this matter, and even as we sit here today, is because appellant did not provide the price information from the contracts at issue. And in fact, some such information was actually redacted from the documents provided by appellant. Appellant has also not provided price information for the pre-addendum contract, which was only for the sale of fixtures, and would thus be particularly helpful, or from other contracts for the sale of similar property. Considering the evidence that there was considerable fabrication performed, it is unreasonable to argue for further adjustments via selective invoices in lieu of just providing the actual documentation needed to, term needed to determine the price of the fixture. Turning to the specific reductions, we will first address additional subcontractor charges totaling $880,000. For these charges, appellant references invoices 27, 38, and 45. 
Invoices 27 and 38 are pages 461 and 465 in the hearing binder. Appellant has not provided invoice 45, but references a draft email in Exhibit 17 as evidence of this charge. With respect to these charges and considering the evidence in the contracts that on-site fabrication labor was performed by the subcontractors, it would be inappropriate to make any further reductions for subcontractor billings. We further note that invoice 27 contains itemized charges and it is not possible to determine whether any labor contained in these charges was actually non-taxable installation labor as opposed to taxable fabrication labor. In addition, invoice 45 has not been provided and Appellant's Exhibit 17 does not provide any indication that this amount related solely to installation labor. Therefore, no adjustments for the additional subcontractor billings are warranted. Similarly, with respect to the construction fee management fees paid to appellant of approximately $3.5 million, we again, no we again note that appellant has not provided the documentation identifying its costs as required by Regulation 1521, and there is no way to determine from the construction management fees which amounts, if any, relate just to non-taxable installation and which amounts relate to taxable fabrication labor. Lastly, this $3.5 million reduction based upon construction management fees paid to s appellant would alone would reduce the taxable measure from $8.9 million to $5.5 million, which is far lower than the $6.8 million liability previously calculated by appellant. Therefore, in the absence of documentation establishing the actual cost attributable to the fixtures, it would again be inappropriate to make further reductions based on partial documentation. There were some other specific reductions referred to, appellant, referred to by appellant in his motion. Uh, they alleged that amounts billed for structural steel and ducts and the amount of $1.2 million were materials used during the installation process and therefore must be excluded from the measure of tax. Um, the scope of work and the declaration of Mr. Gubser established significant fabrication and assembly occurring prior to installation. Any of the property appellant refers to as materials that was attached to the fixture prior to installation would be part of the fixture and part of the retail sale. In addition to the extent that these charges represent the consumption of any actual materials, we note that a construction contractor is the consumer of materials they use in the performance of a construction contract, and that there is no evidence that tax was paid at the time of purchase. Therefore, no reductions to the taxable measure is warranted for this assertion. Appellant also asserts that invoice 14 totaling $1.9 million should be excluded from the audit because the invoice is from 2006. However, Appellant's Exhibit 21, page 453, is the invoice in question, and we note that this invoice is da dated January 12, 2007. It appears that Appellant is referencing a prior version of the invoice. In addition, we note that there are no clauses in the contract passing title at an earlier time and no indication that the sale of the SCR systems occurred in 2006. Accordingly, even if the invoice had not been later revised and issued during the liability period, the evidence indicates that the sale occurred and consequently tax became due in 2007 and there is no basis to make this reduction. Lastly, there was a reference to $65,000 in engineering and service fees that Appellant asserted were not subject to tax. However, Appellant has not provided any eviden evidence establishing that this $65,000 relates solely towards non-taxable non installation labor, labor. Therefore, no basis to make this reduction. In summary, Appellant's predominant business is designing and fabricating SCR systems without installation, and Appellant's initial contract with Big West for the sales at issue was also just for design and fabrication. As such, Appellant should have been able to provide the price of the systems and has not done so. Without means to differentiate between taxable and non-taxable labor, labor charges, the Department reasonably determined that the subcontractor charges totaling approximately $3.2 million was the best available evidence of any non-taxable amounts. In addition, we note that Appellant's prior calculation of its potential tax liability of $6.8 million is proximate to the measure in dispute, especially if the excluded taxable service charges and a more appropriate markup are applied. This further indicates that the reductions asserted by Appellant are not justified and that the Department's determination is reasonable. Without further documentation, such as actual cost sheets, 
identifying the cost of the fixture, appellant has failed to meet its burden and no further reductions based on these partial records is warranted. In light of all the foregoing, this appeal should be denied. Thank you. Uh, thank you. This is Judge Kui. I um, did have a couple questions. So during your presentation, uh, you were saying that it's undisputed that the transaction at issue is um, the one that occurred in 2007, which I think is a reference to the phase two aspect. I'm just curious why, um, what documents or what led you to believe or conclude, uh, CDTFA to conclude that um, it wasn't as uh, appellant um, is contending, you know, it, there was a phase one transaction and a phase two transaction, but w why are you looking at it as, you know, one continuous transaction? I mean, we are looking at a contract and then something else that is referred to as an addendum to the contract. So to us, it seemed like there was initial discussions to design and fabricate an SCR system, and that later that agreement was modified to include installation. Uh, my inclusion of the word undisputed was probably inaccurate given the uh, testimony and presentation today by opposing counsel. Okay. So um, if, I, and I just want to look at it, um, you know, from appellant's perspective, if, if we were to look at it, you know, and we just look at that first phase one aspect and, you know, forget it for a moment that they, they also did the installation. If you look at their phase one aspect and treat it as one transaction and then you stop there, would, would CDTFA agree that in that case there wouldn't be a construction contractor? This would be a sale of TPP and you could, you know, accept a resale certificate for that? Uh, we don't have any evidence that the sale of the design, like the fabricated system, occurred prior to the installation in this case. Um, so I don't know that those facts are in existence. And again, I think the problem we would run into is that we can't look at it in a vacuum. We know that the SCR system was furnished and installed by appellant. And Regulation 1521 is very specific to say that you cannot avoid sales tax liability for this. Right. I, I guess... What I was wondering is, um, is it is there a way that they could structure it? And I, I'm not sure if that was, you know, appropriate here. That's, I think that's what we were being asked to sure. determine. But um, is it possible for you know someone to schedule a, a transaction or a, a, a project as two separate transactions, one for the sale of TPP and a separate transaction for you know the installation thereof? You know, I think like if they make that separate, is it possible to do it that way? Or are you saying that um, as soon as you add the second component, whether it's the same transaction or a separate transaction, that would throw in 1521 and, you know, you can't, like, I, I guess that would subsequently retroactively invalidate a, a resale certificate that might have been accepted prior to them negotiating the second transaction? Um, I mean, there's there's a lot there. I, I am aware um, of very particular circumstances where design aspects, not fabrication, but design aspects of TPP uh, will sometimes be excluded under Regulation 1501.1, um, Research and Development Contracts. Uh, there are very specific ways that needs to be done and has to be a qualified contract. When it comes to two separate contracts for design of what is a fixture, and subsequent installation of the fixture. I think we're going to run into issues both with the step doctrine, which would be if you have a series of transactions that could be construed as a way to avoid tax or misappropriate the application of the law, they would disregard some of those transactions. Uh, and then I, another issue that I'm going to run into is the sales and use tax law's definition of sales price, like the price of tangible personal property, whether fabrication and design of it occurs prior to um, the contract for the sale of the actual thing. The sales price of tangible personal property includes all charges for design, fabrication, and things of that nature. So if LTA would like additional briefing post-hearing, we'd be willing to provide it. But I do not think that separating a contract of uh, design and fabrication and subsequent installation of it onto real property would render uh, Regulation 1521 like inapplicable in this circumstance. So Please. I guess what I was thinking is that, you know, if, because I mean, when they had the first phase transaction, they had the resale certificate. At the time they accepted the resale certificate, it seems like that was before they even did the addendum for the second phase. So then sure. you're saying that, hey, you know, maybe at the time 
or maybe, yeah, and I, maybe I shouldn't say you're saying, but at the time they, they accepted the resale certificate, that could have been a valid resale certificate, but then based on the fact that they addended, uh, amended the contract, then they have to go back and say the resale certificate is invalid, basically, because you, you know, you're know you now transforming it into a construction contract. Mm -hmm. It just seems like... Once they perform the construction contract, Regulation 1521 says they cannot avoid their liability for sales or use tax by accepting a resale certificate. Right. So, I mean, I, no, like, I, I, there's the money that is at issue, the deficiency was paid after the agreement for installation. I, I don't think we have the, effect, the facts in existence that you're asking, but I think Scott may have had a response. I was just going to make that same point, that again, the facts here are that at the time of the sales, they were a construction contract. So when we talk about whether they can accept a resale certificate that's tied to when they're making the sale, they were a construction contractor and they cannot avoid the liability. I think you might have some hypotheticals about if there was different facts with regard to making a sale when they're not a construction contractor and then contracting to install, but those aren't the facts here. The facts here are that they, they were a construction contractor and cannot accept a resale certificate when they made the sale of the so TPP. You're saying that the payment occurred after they had negotiated the phase two aspect, so you're saying that the sale occurred in the, I guess, the construction um, aspect occurred in this phase two, so that's why you're you're considering it as one continuous transaction. Well, is um, a sale generally occurs upon physical delivery of the TPP. Right, and or so or if um, or if, or if otherwise stated, the title passes. Okay, and so so you're saying the sale occurred after they had negotiated the phase two addendum. Is is that what you're saying? Isn't that it would appear that the sale occurred when the fact when the SCR systems were turned over to um, Big West. Okay, um, and so just moving over to the subcontractor aspect. Um, so if they had hired subcontractors uh, to do the installation, my understanding was that you CDTFA deleted a portion of the subcontractor um, chargers, but then not all of them? Is that a correct, like, summary? Yeah. Um, excuse me. Um, there was an initial measure that was all of the uh, invoices for 2007, or uh, sales journal for 2007 related to this contract were totaled, and that was around $12.1 million. In preparation, during the appeals conference within CDTFA, Two-thirds of the invoices were provided. Um, some of those were talked about today as sample invoices, and some of those documents and invoices have lump sum um, charges for subcontractors on there. Um, the department, without having the actual costs of the fixture, determined that that was the best available evidence of any non-taxable installation labor and accepted that. However, looking at the scope of works and other statements, it appears that there was on-site fabrication, although I know appellant says this was all installation. Um, so to make further adjustments for subcontractor labor, labor just on the blanket assertion that any labor performed by the subcontractors was non-taxable installation labor doesn't seem appropriate. So appellant in its motion identified additional subcontractor costs that it says should be excluded from the measure of tax and absent further documentation actually establishing the cost of the fixtures. We argue that no further reductions are warranted. Okay. And um, yeah, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, okay, so just to walk me through that, so you know if the subcontractor did say the reactor, they furnished and installed it, or, or if they did the foundations, you know, they're my understanding the consumer of the materials, they're the retailer of the fixtures, they would have either paid tax um, at the time of their purchase of the uh, materials that they're using or, or they would have charged tax to appellants uh, for, for the sale of fixtures. Oh, but then there's, uh, yeah, I'm sorry, but then the fixtures were furnished by appellant. Okay, I see. Um, okay, I think I see what you're saying. I should turn it over to Judge uh, Aldrich. Do you have any questions for CDTFA? Judge Aldrich, I don't have any questions for CDTFA. Thank you. Okay, and uh, Judge Brown, do you have any questions for CDTFA? Um, I will try to be quick. Um, I wanted to ask about CDTFA's argument regarding uh, good, um, whether an uh, appellant accepted the resale certificate in good faith. Yes, Judge Brown. 
Um, so I'm sure you know the wording of Regulation 1668 uh, Subdivision C, I think, regarding um, the presumption of good yes. faith if the resale certificate is um, regular on its face. Mm -hmm. And it starts with saying, like, in the absence of evidence to the contrary, this presumption applies. Yes. So if I understand your CDTFA's argument, is essentially that the evidence is um, the regulation itself, that appellant couldn't have accepted the resale certificate in good faith because your the legal interpretation wouldn't allow them to? Um, I think it's more that, and this is pretty much only in a circumstance involving 1521 and 1668 or maybe some other statute that makes you a declared retailer, but is that when 1521 declares that a construction contractor is always the retailer of a fixture and that they cannot take a resale certificate to avoid their sales tax liability, it stands to follow that you cannot in good faith think that you as a construction contractor are making a sale for resale to the person who you're installing the fixture for. But so if CDTFA's audit staff Except initially accepted um, that the that appellant accepted the resale certificate in good faith. Mm -hmm. um, I, I understand that CDTFA has now switched its position, but I guess my question is: if the audit staff thought that was a plausible argument, um, how do we know that the appellant didn't think it was a plausible argument that the that this was a sale for resale? I think audit staff's interpretation of good faith was in error, um, but I certainly understand the circumstance you're pointing out. But I would just say that their previous interpretation or their acceptance of the resale certificate was accepted in good faith was an error by them. And then I, I want to stress that, like it, Regulation 1521's statement that a construction contractor cannot avoid their tax liability by accepting a resale certificate um, would kind of trump whether or not this was accepted in good faith to begin with. I, I don't have anything further. Thank you. Okay, so um, I believe there are no further questions from the panel for CDTFA. So at this point, we have 10 minutes, I believe, for uh, Appellant's uh, final rebuttal uh, before we conclude. Uh, so it's approximately 3.05, so Mr. Venetieri, you have until 3.15. Um, oh, I'm sorry, I thought someone was asking a question, uh, but yeah. So, so Judge Kui, there has been much thrown out just now, and 10 minutes is not going to take care of all the different items that were just set forth by the CTDFA Council, and um, I'm going to need a little bit more time than that, 10 minutes. Okay, so we don't have any hearings after us, um, and I think we have the room until, well, I don't want to say <laughs> give you a carte blanche to stay, to stay until you, uh, but I, can I just get an idea of how much uh, time that you're, you're looking for? Uh, I'm sorry, probably uh, 20 minutes, maybe a little bit more. Okay, yeah, that is fine. Did you, uh, you know, because we talked about a lot here, did you want us to call a recess to um, go over your notes and, and decide w what you want to talk about, or are you ready to proceed right now? I, I, I think we just soon go ahead and proceed. Okay. Um, so, yeah, 20 minutes. Uh, so I, I'd say uh, if you can do it by, finish by 3.30, that would be uh, much appreciated. I'm, I'm going to work the best I can. Okay, thank you. So... What, what's particularly bothersome about this is I've heard nothing, basically, but supposition. If it's this, then it must be this. If it's 1668, then 1521 actually is, in essence, Trump's. And when asked the question about good faith, well, it has to be good faith because 1521 says what it says, so there, ergo it could not have been good faith. Doesn't, the law doesn't say that. That's an interpretation that they just came up with. So let me, let me go through my notes here 
and um, uh, I want to go back to the very beginning. And that is, we have a timeline here. We have two transactions. We have one for design and fab and one for installation. One clearly happened before the other. There was no uh, uh, contradiction of the fact that there were two. And yet we just heard, well, there must be one because of the way it went down. And there was supposition, again, about title. When did the sale take place? There's been no facts and evidence. It was all supposition. But what we do know is that there were two transactions. And even I heard counsel indicate that there were two transactions. So let's, let's make sure, and let's go back to what Mr. Gubser said about the two transactions and how it went down and why it went the way it did. He is a percipient witness. There are no questions. There's no contradiction of his testimony. He was there. He was both there on the design and fab as well as the installation. So I, I want to get us back in that mindset and away from the, the, the supposition. And I think even uh, counsel indicated that, that there normally, as, as was indicated, that there are, uh, they are in the business of doing design and fab. So let's go from there. And just I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go through a couple items here. Uh, with regard to um, the, um, uh, th this, this issue of the um, uh, fabrication or the concession that it was, uh, in essence, um, good uh, the, the, on the good faith issue, and that um, apparently we had audits saying one thing and legal now saying something else, and Judge Brown, I think you, you pointed that out, um, uh, and... And I think there was a very good uh, question uh, asked. Well, if you have a phase one, uh, would it, uh, CDTF agree uh, that you're selling TPP? And the answer that came back, or, and then, then it was, I w didn't fully understand the answer, but then the question was asked, and is it possible to do two different transactions? And what I heard was, well, 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 we know 1501.1, well, we all know what 1501.1 is all about. Many of us were there when it was written. It has nothing to do with this situation here. Well, this is possibly a step transaction. Really? There's no such thing as a step transaction in this situation. No, you asked the right question. Could you do one contract and perform it and then later get asked to do a bid as the timeline says, and then get that install contract, does that somehow, in essence, what they're saying impliedly, well, does that trump the fact that you had one contract for design and fab? The answer is no. Those are two separate contracts. And there's no facts and evidence that somehow conjoins both of those into one. It's, there's no facts and evidence. Once again, supposition supposition. Let's deal with the facts. Um, much of what was just said was, I heard the word, it would appear. Um, and that sale took place after delivery. I don't want to repeat myself, but there's no facts and evidence. There's two contracts. That's what the evidence is. You heard Mr. Gubser sit right here, and he talked about the MSA, and he talked about the, the um, uh, in June, and then he talked about the resale certificate, and then he talked about the bid on the install, then he talked about the, the 07 uh, contract. So um, once again, I, I want to stick with, with the facts, and I'll, I'll just hit very qu uh, quickly this issue. Uh, there is a concession made. You asked a very right question. This audit staff is very sharp. Why would they say that, yes, you took it in good faith? Why would you say you, they took it in good faith if they didn't think that what was going on here was a sale of design and fab? I mean, otherwise, why would the staff, the, the, the sales tax department say, yeah, it was good faith? It's only after the fact now that gets up to this level 
that the tune has changed a little bit. So, I'm, uh, you know, a concession was made. I think there's a, uh, the concession is a concession. I think there was a, a basis for it because now I'm engaged in supposition because they knew this was a design and fab contract. Um, let me just also quickly say that where there's an inconsistency between the reg and the statute, um, the reg has to be within the scope of the authority conferred, um, and the reg can't trump the statute. Now, I understand that was argued at the lower level. We're different counsel. We're not putting a lot of emphasis on that because there's facts now that have now come out that I don't think came out at the lower level at, CD, at CDTFA. So, um, but, but there's also an issue that has come up here. He talked about fixtures. Now, Mr. Gubser took some time to talk about the units, and he showed you the pictures. And it's always easy to say, well, yeah, look at this. Look at the wiring, and look at how this and that and that. But Mr. Gubser said that they were done in a way to stack one on top of the other, one on top of the other, like the erector set, and and that in that manner, they do not lose their identity. And he showed you in the pictures, for the example, the ammonia, ammonia that was right there, and he showed the control area right next to it. So th these are not fixtures per se. Fixtures are a situation where TPP loses its identity. This did not lose its identity. The fact is, as he indicated, Mr. Gubser indicated that if you were to take the tall stack and you want to disassemble it, you disassemble it piece by piece by piece by piece. So it, 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 it didn't lose its identity, and I'm just going to indicate, and you can all look at this, um, but they talk about the um, uh, C train case, etc. cetera. Um, those are all property tax cases. And some of you are familiar with property tax. There's the C train case, and then there's the U.S. Lines case. And the U.S. Lines case was all about sales tax. And that there was a distinction, a determination that for sales tax, a fixture could be looked at one way, but for property tax, it would be look, could be looked at a different way. Now, m many of us who used to be at the Board of Equalization would say the law should be the law. It shouldn't make a difference. I mean, a fixture is a fixture. But the law, the cases have come out that said that property tax doesn't necessarily provide the outlet uh, that you're looking for, or at least I think staff's looking for, relative to sales tax. And you can look that up, and we've talked about that. So let me go to something else that was said here, um, and that is that um, if we go to what's our exhibit two, this is the DNR, and if you go look at page sixteen. Um, and the um, uh, Mr. Gladfelder, who's tax counsel, who wrote it, he made the comment on page 16, lines 16 through 20, or excuse me, 15 through 20. He says, however, petitioner did not provide any additional documentation regarding the measure of tax, and to date has not provided any source documentation regarding the measure of tax, backup, or evidence to support his spreadsheets. Thus, petitioner has not provided any source documentation to support his spreadsheets or claimed adjustments, and we reject its fourth argument. Now, what we did today, what we tried to do in that motion a year ago, what we did today is Ms. Verdugo went through source documentation. You heard Mr. Gubzer say, I was involved in writing those up. And he went through them with Ms. Verdugo to make sure that we knew exactly what each of those line items were. You heard no questions asked of Mr. Gubser. Well, did it really mean this, as you said, or did it really mean this? It's uncontradicted. Mr. Gubser helped write those because he was in charge of the installation project. We're well past design and fab at this point in time. 
So that's percipient witness testimony. And unless, unless somehow it's been contradicted, and unless he doesn't have credibility, I'm strongly encouraging the panel to say, well, gee whiz, that must be the way it is. He and Ms. Verdugo went through those, and we only gave you a couple of them today because we could spend a lot of time doing it. But I'm asking you, with respect to what Mr. Gladfelder said in his DNR, we now have done what he requested. And yes, they partially followed through on Mr. Gladfelder by giving a $3.1 million deduct, but it wasn't enough because they did not go through the source documents as we have now given it to you here. So we're asking you that with respect to the installation, that installation, what we have given, needs to be pulled out because it's non-taxable. And there's some other items other than fabricate, uh, insulation labor on that. Um, let me go to um, a statement was made. Once again, supposition, no facts and evidence. Quote, there is evidence that the fabrication labor was minimized and installation was maximized. There's no facts and evidence. Supposition, once again. Quote, there was considerable fabrication performed, assumedly on the ground. That's what was stated. Mr. Gubser specifically said when asked by Ms. Verdugo, well, how was her fabrication done? And we all know that if you take that long stack and you put it into to, to five pieces on the ground and you bolt it together on the ground and then you raise it up, that's fabrication labor. We know that. There's a number of cases that I had in front of the old Board of Equalization where we had similar situation. But if they did the erector set, if they did it, the foundation, put on the foundation, first piece, tied it down, put the second one on, put the third one, that's installation. Now, it seems really silly that we have these kinds of distinctions between installation and fabrication in this kind of context, but it's the rule. And that's what we follow. And Mr. Gubser gave you uncontradicted testimony that that's how it was done. So we can't engage in supposition. Um, we talked about your question, Judge Kui, about two different transactions. It is entirely possible to do two transactions. There's no question about it. And underlying what's, what's troublesome to me, to be very candid with you, is in these situations, uh, someone always says, oh, we're going to take a, a, a one, one, make it one contract for design, fabrication, and installation. You know we're going to put in two and that way we can show that part of it is taxable potentially and part of it is not taxable. There's no evidence of that here whatsoever. I understand that. There are taxpayers who do that. That's not what's going on here. That's not the testimony. That's not the documentation. So um, to, to basically say that, um, um, that, th th that uh, there's no evidence uh, in, along those lines, uh, whatsoever, and, and I'll, I'll go ahead and finish up here. Um, we have two transactions right here in the timeline. It's very clear. There's no discussion of tidal passage or any of that stuff, all right? That was all supposition. We here have given you facts. That's why we brought Mr. Gubser in, and we're very thankful that Mr. Gubser is able to be with us because this is a long time ago. The department has nobody. Much of it is just basically audit work papers and what they thought was, was the best under the circumstances. We brought Mr. Gubser in. We found him, to be candid with you, in going through our due diligence a couple of years ago because we knew we were going to end up here at some point in time. And we've spent a lot of time with Ms. Mr. Gubser just to make sure his memory, his recollection, he's gone through the documents. You heard him, I'll say it again. He, those were his invoices. He's, he was hands-on. And um, 
There, there's been no contradictory testimony to what Mr. Gubser said. Um, I'm just going to indicate to you that unless there has been something to contradict Mr. Gubser, I'm going to say it again, that you need to take, and if you find him to be credible, then you need to take his testimony as evidence. And what we have here is we have all the documents, and we gave you source documentation that they did not have previously, and they kind of used it to try to come up and say, well, if you've done this, then, then it should have been this, but you know, if you've done this, which is what happens in these cases a lot when you don't have direct uh, knowledge and you're on the part of the department. It's been my experience. You get engage in supposition. So I'm just going to indicate to you, if you find Mr. Gubser to be credible, you find that what he said makes sense, that it meets essentially the timeline, um, then his, and his testimony corroborates the documentation. It's not as if he's just coming out here out of the blue. No, his testimony corroborates the documentation that we've given you and, and some, of the some of the documentation that the department already had. I just wish we'd had him at the lower level, but we weren't counsel at that time. So uh, I just want to indicate that we are of the belief that there are two contracts. The resale certificate was properly given and relied upon uh, that with respect to the installation and the labor and the uh, uh, service that went into it, um, as, as Ms. Verdugo has put together, she ticked, ticked and tied with Mr. Gubser. Uh, and um, you, you heard a little bit of that here. We didn't give it all to you. Um, but we have met our burden of proof. We've met our burden of proof. We've given you hard evidence in the way of testimony and documentation. And we uh, strongly request that you find for the appellant under these circumstances with that documentation and with that credible testimony brought to you by Mr. Gubser. And we thank you for your time today. Uh, thank you. Um, there are just a couple items. Uh, one, I wanted to see if the parties were in agreement. Um, so the resale certificate was dated, it looks like, 103106. Is there any dispute that the resale certificate was accepted on 103106? Or I can't. I, I mean, I think it speaks for itself. Okay. And the document does. Uh, for CDTFA, do you have any? Um, do Do you have a position on whether the resale certificate was accepted on 103106? Um, we don't have an official position on that. We would assume that it was on or about shortly thereafter the date of the resale certificate. Okay, and then um, as far as the addendum authorizing phase two, it looks like that was signed on 2-28-07. Uh, I just double check with, uh, I'll start with the appellant. Do you have any, uh, are you in agreement that that was the date the addendum was uh, signed or do you have a position on it, that? Actually, um, there's one other item that goes with this. Um, and... Um, Mr. Gubster didn't talk to it, but I'll point out to you, if you look at, um, it's R12, it says Addendum to Master Service Agreement. Turn a couple pages, and you'll see back there, Owner, uh, Big West, and you'll see Contractor, Applied Utility Systems, you'll see Mr. Gubster there, see his signature there. Okay. Um, do you want to do that? Yeah, and, and Judge Kui, further to you, uh, if you look at 12, and uh, Ms. Verdugo and Ms. Mr. Gubster did not go over it, but if you go to 12, um, 12 is pretty lengthy, but if you go to just before what we have in our book here is tab 13, about um, six or seven pages back from that, um, you'll see a letter dated uh, via email January 30th, 2007. Are, are you all there? I'm 
So exhibit 13, go a couple pages back to 12. Just, just before, couple, a couple pages before uh, 13, exhibit 13. And was that the January 30th? Was e seven letter? Yes, to Mr. Mark Dennis. Okay, I see that, yes. Okay, so that's part of 12 and the addendum that you asked, you just asked the question about uh, you know, when was, and we said February 9th on its face. You'll note that this letter, um, and I'll make a representation to you, if you go to the third page, uh, it's signed by David A. Gubser, project manager. I'll make a representation. This miss. This is Mr. Gubser's letter, um, which basically um, lays out um, Exhibit 12 and the addendum that we're talking about right now. So once again, he's boots on the ground, he's there, and that's what this letter's all about. Okay. Um, so in any event, it was sometime, if you take these two documents together, it was sometime between January and February that the uh, second uh, amendment one was negotiated and, and agreed upon. That's correct. And does CDTFA have a position on, on that amendment? No, that sounds about right. Okay. Um, and I guess the last question that I had at this point, is there an agreement on what portion of the remaining liability is allocable to phase one versus phase two? Could you repeat the question? I was asking if there was an agreement between the parties between what portion of the liability is allocable to the phase one versus the phase two? I think in our in our motion we went through the invoices and we split out and that's one of the reasons we had Mr. Gubster explain the invoices. The first part is um, amount related to the uh, design and fabrication. Uh, the middle section is the duct and steel that's you know they were also contracted to uh, fabricate. And the third bottom part is related to the installation contract, which includes the construction management and the subcontractor. So I believe we've detailed that out and separated that out in our motion. Okay, and I would turn to CDTFA. Do you have a position or comments uh, or response to, I guess, just a breakdown of the liability? The liability is based upon 2007 invoices and sales journal entries. Um, the $12.1 million total, which was reduced down to 8.2. So I guess you could say we agree that the $3.2 million the department removed during the appeals process from the $12 million total is not subject to tax, and that would be it. Okay, I, so I, don't, I, don't, I don't agree to any allocation of TPP fabricated in Phase 1 not being taxable now. Okay. Um, yeah, I understand your position. I was just uh, organizing it um, for my understanding of, you know, understanding both party sides. Uh, so with that said, I believe there are additional questions from Judge Brown for appellant's representative. Can I add so one more thing on the 12 mi million? Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. Um, yeah. Please proceed. So um, in our motion, again, I, I'm going back to that question um, um, uh, Mr. Aldridge uh, uh, asked about the accountant and that other schedule. So in order to make this easier, we started with their documentation of the 12 million with the invoices and the sales journal. So we start with the same, in the same place at the 12 million. We acknowledge the three point something that they removed, but then we walk you through what other steps they missed because they didn't know what it was or they didn't maybe look at it closely enough. And so we deduct from that 12 million additional amounts and we explain what that is and we point out what was equipment, what was installation. So I just wanted to say that we start in the same place now. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, at this point, I will turn it over to Judge Brown. I think Judge Brown has a couple questions for the appellant representative. Well, it's getting late, so I'll try to be brief. Um, uh, for appellant's representatives, um, if y I'm sure you're familiar with, uh, in Regulation 1521, exit. Uh, Appendix B lists uh, examples of fixtures 
And so my question is, and I, if you want to turn to that page first, it's fine. I'm not going to get super specific about it, but go, go ahead if you want I, to. I brought the book for a reason. Okay. <laughs> Yes, yeah, so you're you're asking. Um, of course, we, we have this in here about the elevator installations and all that that business. Um, so I, I just wanted to ask um, your argument that uh, the TPP at issue here is readily removable and therefore is not, doesn't meet the definition of fixtures. How does that compare with um, examples in Appendix B, like? Uh, removal of air conditioning units, signs, or television antennas? Um, I'm looking here, 1521, it's, um, as you say, Appendix B. Mm -hmm. um, and that this is the item regarded, regarded as fixtures. Um, the I, I think you need to speak into the microphone, sorry. I'm sorry, <laughs> okay. I'm looking here at, um, for example, furnaces, boilers, and heating units. Is that what you're referring to? Um, well, like I said, I was the examples I had picked up were air conditioning units, signs, and television antennas. But I can hold on. Y y yes, I, I I see what you're referring to there. Um, so. How, how would you compare, are you arguing that this T, the TPP at issue here, the SCR systems are readily removable and therefore they're not fixtures, they're but aren't television antennas readily remo more readily removable than the SCR systems? So um, I see television antennas, I'm, are we talking, part of the problem with this is are we talking about the big television transmission uh, or are we talking about a, a television antenna on somebody's home? There's a little bit of a difference, obviously, there. Um, I, I, I would, I, to be very um, candid with you, th these items, there, there is some similarity to our situation here. Uh, but what I would say to you uh, is the fact that, that uh, once again, it comes down to how is it affixed and what's the, what's the, um, ability to to disassemble it and to take it down. I, I think Mr. Gubser said that when they were contracted by Big West to design and fabricate that uh, part of their agreement was if Big West wanted to take the, those systems down, that they could take the systems down and they designed them to take the systems down and I think I heard Mr. Gubster say that in taking it down, they also had to do it in such a way that the refinery would not be shut down, that the refinery continued to deal with uh, processing oil, but, but if they were going to take it down, that they could do it in such a way that it wouldn't stop the refinery. So um, I, it was, in my view, it was designed um, why, why they would ever want to do it, I don't know. I'm not Big West, and I'm just a lawyer doing this. But um, I think they designed them to be able to take them down. Would it, would, could they take it down in one day? No. And Mr. Gubser said that. Uh, Judge, Judge Brown, may we comment on this question or provide a response? Ye yes, that's fine. Go ahead. Uh, you can we, respond. We just want to add that in addition to Appendix B, the definition of fixtures is something that specifically does not lose its identity. Uh, when attached to Realty. And so when appellant has argued that these are not fixtures because they uh, don't lose their identity, he's more accurately, they are more accurately describing a material. Um, and whether or not it loses identity is not a distinction between a fixture and machinery equipment because neither lose their identity when attached to fixtures, to Realty. Uh, I, I don't have any further questions. Okay, uh, this is Judge Kui. Um, oh, actually, I'll turn to Judge Aldrich. Did you have any questions before we conclude? This is Judge Aldrich. No questions. Thank you. Okay, I, um, we're ready to conclude this uh, hearing. This case is submitted on Tuesday, September 20th, uh, 2022. The time is approximately 3.40 p.m. 
Uh, the record is now closed. I'd like to thank everyone for coming in today. Uh, the judges, this panel, will meet and decide your case later on, and we'll send a written decision to the participants uh, within 100 days of today's hearing. Uh, today's hearing in the appeal of CSI Elysio, Inc. is now adjourned, and this concludes the oral hearing matter scheduled for this afternoon. Uh, we will resume tomorrow, um, I believe, at 9.30 a.m. Uh, for Tuesday, uh, for Wednesday the 21st. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you.